gospel. The gospel lesson, which also serves as our sermon text for today, from the Gospel of John, chapter 16, verses 5 to 11. But now I am going to him who sent me. None of you asks me, where are you going? Rather, you are filled with grief because I have said these things. But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the Advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin, and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father, where you can see me no longer. And about judgment, because the Prince of this world now stands condemned. This is the Gospel of our Lord. From our ascended and glorified Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, God's grace, His mercy and peace be with all of you. Okay. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ our Savior, how many of you would feel comfortable driving a bulldozer? I'm sure all the little boys are going, come on. And it would be cool. And probably a lot of fun. But I would bet most of us would be a little bit tentative, at least at first, in driving a bulldozer because of all the power that it has. I mean, think about the power a bulldozer has. It can has the power to move earth. Take big piles of dirt and just flatten it out with seemingly little effort. That's a lot of power right at the end of your fingertips. And might make us a little bit scared at first to drive it. Well, today as we celebrate Pentecost, we're really celebrating power. It's a power that is much more powerful than any bulldozer or earth mover or front end loader, maybe all of them combined. This is the power that brought us to faith. This is the power that works through us as we carry out the work of our Savior to be His witnesses to the world. We're talking about the power of the Holy Spirit. Today we celebrate the blessing of the Holy Spirit which Jesus sent to us from heaven's throne just as He promised. And as the Holy Spirit has come to us and continues to come to us through word and sacrament, He strengthens us with spiritual strength and energy that we need to live to God's glory. And he emboldens us to proclaim God's word as we go out as his witnesses to the world. And while both of those things may be a little bit scary for us from time to time, God comes to us through his word today to strengthen and renew us. As he reminds us, you've got the power. Now, that power of the Holy Spirit can be seen no better place than in the effect which he had on Jesus' disciples. The disciples that we see in Jesus in our text are not the same disciples that we see in the account of Pentecost. The words of our text were words Jesus spoke on Monday Thursday. That's the night that Judas betrayed Jesus the night before his death. And Jesus tells us that his disciples were filled with grief. They were sad, worried, full of anxiety because of the things Jesus had just told them. You see, in their discourse as they ate the Passover meal, Jesus had just told them the world was going to hate them because of him. And that they were going to face many difficulties and challenges in serving him. But that isn't what caused them concern. No, Jesus went on then to tell them all that was about to happen. And that he would, in the very near future, be leaving them. That's what caused them concern. Peter and John, at separate points, did ask where Jesus was going. But that's not where their minds were focused. They were 
more concerned about what was going to happen to them after Jesus left. They wondered how they'd be able to face this trouble and difficulty if, if Jesus wasn't right there physically with them. I think we understand their grief. I mean, how much of our grief comes from focusing our attention on the things of this world rather than focusing on what God has waiting for us in Jesus? We live in the same world of, of trouble and difficulty and sin that the disciples lived in. We face some of that same trouble and difficulty for serving our Savior and proclaiming His Word. It's easy to feel all alone when you face that difficulty for living as God's people. Maybe even we voice concerns that were right along the same line that the, that the disciples did. Jesus! If you were just here with me where I could see you, if I could, could see you physically, it would be so much easier for me to face this trouble. It's easy to, to let the focus be completely on ourselves and, and accuse Jesus of leaving us or abandoning us at those times. It's easy for us to start to, start to doubt God's love and care and let ourselves get filled with fear as we think about the outcome. We can lose sight of, of the big picture. Focus only on ourselves and not think about Jesus at all. That's exactly where the disciples were. They were filled with grief because they were more focused on Jesus leaving than on where Jesus was going. So he, he spoke these words of our text to provide comfort for them as they face these challenges. Yes, he was going to leave them, but he wasn't abandoning them. He promised he would send them a counselor, an advocate, the Holy Spirit, who would, would lead them into all truth. They wouldn't have the benefit of, of Jesus being there physically, but they wouldn't need him physically. They would have the Holy Spirit and all the power that came with him. But for that to happen, Jesus needed to leave. To be able to send the Holy Spirit, Jesus needed to be glorified. And for Him to be glorified, He first needed to suffer, and then die, and then rise from the grave, and then ascend to heaven's throne. You see, without Jesus completing His work, the work of the Holy Spirit would have been worse. Without Jesus completing the salvation for which He came, the Holy Spirit would have no way to work saving faith in the hearts of people. It was only once Jesus had continued on his mission and completed that mission that he could send the Holy Spirit. Only then, as he sat on heaven's throne, could he keep that promise. And keep that promise he did. And what a change we see in the disciples. These disciples who were filled with grief and anxiety as they pondered the future were the very ones who stood boldly in the temple, proclaiming God's word to the Jews who had just killed Jesus. The same disciples who, who hid in that upper room behind locked doors out of fear of the Jewish leaders were the very ones who accused those Jewish leaders of killing the Messiah and then directing them to that Messiah for forgiveness. You see, that change is the work of the Holy Spirit. That's the power the Holy Spirit has. He convicted the disciples of their sin and convinced them of the righteousness that Jesus gave to them. He gave them a full understanding of everything Jesus had done for them. He proved to them that the devil had been defeated and had no power over them. Not only did he enlighten them to know the, the full truth of Jesus, but he's also the one who emboldened them carry out that work of being Jesus' witnesses to the world. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. And you've got that same power working in you. I mean, just look around this sanctuary today and you see a display of the Spirit's power. That any of us would have set aside our normal life to gather in God's house for worship this morning is, demonstrates the power of the Holy Spirit. That any of us would, would not only know Jesus as Savior, but believe and trust in Him as our Savior is 
evidence of the Holy Spirit's work among us. See, Scripture gives us a, 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 an important truth that helps us understand the power of the Holy Spirit. Scripture tells us that all of us, every single one of us, are born into this world as sinners. Spiritually dead, separated from God, and destined for hell. That's a hard truth. It's a hard truth for us. We like to think babies are, are pure and innocent. That may be true when it comes to how they look, but it's not true when we're talking about their status before God. We're all sinful from the moment of our conception and born into this world spiritually dead. We can't do anything to save ourselves. We can't by ourselves know Jesus or come to Him or believe in Him or trust in Him. We can't do a thing. It's only when the Holy Spirit comes through the God's Word as it is shared with us or the waters of baptism as they are poured over us that the Holy Spirit brings us to spiritual life. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. He brings the dead to life. He breathed into us spiritual life so that we can know our Savior and believe in Him. And that same Holy Spirit continues to come through word and sacrament to strengthen and to renew us as God's people. See, it's the Holy Spirit working in us that leads us to come not only to worship once, but week after week after week. It's the Holy Spirit working in us that leads us not only to love God, but to reflect God's love in the life that we live as God's people. It's the Holy Spirit working in us that, that leads us to see everything that we have as a gift from our Heavenly Father to be used for God's glory and to carry on God's work. It's the Holy Spirit working in us that leads Christian husbands to love their wives as Christ loved the church and leads Christian wives to respect their husbands and work alongside of them for the benefit of the family. It's the Holy Spirit working in us that, that leads us to use our time and our talents and our abilities not only to, to share God's Word with one another at all stages of life, but to take that Word and, and, and share it with our world. Every person in worship, every minute, an ounce of money that are given in support of the work of God's kingdom, every service, every talent, every ability that is used to carry out God's work is evidence of the Holy Spirit. That's the power of the Holy Spirit, and you've got that power working. You also have that power working through you. Peter was the one with the privilege of preaching the sermon that first Pentecost day as we heard it in our second lesson. You remember the results of that sermon? 3,000 people came to faith that day. Wow, 3,000 people. Peter didn't argue with them. He didn't debate with them or, or beat them into submission. He simply shared with them the truth very Bluntly pointing out their sin, but very lovingly pointing them to the forgiveness and salvation of Jesus. And 3,000 people believed. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. It was the Holy Spirit working through that message that convicted the people of their sin in general, and their sin in particular of, of killing the one God sent to be the Messiah. It was the Holy Spirit who convicted them that they deserved damnation for their sin. But it was also the Holy Spirit who then convinced them of the righteousness Jesus gave to them. It was the Holy Spirit who convinced them that the righteousness that they needed to be able to stand before God and live forever did not come from within them. It wasn't something they could earn or that they could work for. It was a gift that God had given them in Jesus. It was the Holy Spirit proved to them that the devil had been defeated and assured them of everlasting life. 3,000 people came to believe in Jesus that day. Now you and I might hear that and think, wow, that'd be cool. It'd be cool that I can empower and influence that your word would lead 3,000 people to faith. 
Well, let me tell you something. You do. You may not get to preach a sermon that brings 3,000 people to faith, but that Bible story that you share with your child or grandchild, as you tell them that Jesus loves them, is just as powerful. A simple Bible story told in Sunday school has the power to work and to create faith and equip little hearts for lives of service. The, the faithful father explaining the perplexities of life to maturing children in the light of God's word has just as much power and influence in the life of that child. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. That's his, his work. A, a simple devotion shared with someone who's sick or hospitalized or shared with someone who's troubled has the power to, to lift them up and comfort them. A simple Bible passage shared with someone who has never heard of Jesus has the power to, to awaken that person to faith. So you've got the power that Peter had as he preached that sermon that day because that wasn't Peter's power. That was the Holy Spirit. It was the Holy Spirit working in Peter that led him to a recognition of what Jesus had done for him. And it was the Holy Spirit working through Peter that brought such a, re uh, such a response in the hearts of the people who heard it. And you've got that same power. Now, let me share a little bit of the background so that we understand fully this situation before us. It sounds awesome that 3,000 people came to faith. But when you consider there was one or two million people in Jerusalem at that time, you realize 3,000 is, is a rather small percentage. I think that gives us some comfort when, when we don't always see the results that we want to see from our outreach efforts. I think it also reminds us how important and valuable every single soul is to our Lord. I had the opportunity to, to witness a baptism today and and, and, and see the power of the Holy Spirit on display. Every soul is important. We'll witness a confirmation in just a few moments. Where faith is publicly confessed. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. And every single soul is important. And that's not because of my work or your work or anything that we have done. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. That's God caring for each and every individual soul. And you've got that power working in you and through you. And so my only question is, what are you going to do with that power? Don't let it scare you or frighten you. Put it to action. And let that power work in the lives of more people. Jesus has called every Christian, not just us as the church, but us individually, to go make disciples of all nations. He sends us out to be his witnesses to the world, but he doesn't send us alone. He promises the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's power to go with us and work through that message. So let's immerse ourselves where the Holy Spirit is, God's word and sacrament, to, to strengthen our faith. And then let's go forward in ministry, boldly proclaiming the one message of Jesus our Savior that can bring true peace and joy. Let's go do our work of sharing the word of Jesus. So the Holy Spirit can do His work of working and strengthening faith. And let's do that confidently. Knowing that you got that power. Amen. Please stand.